I had the privilege to go to, to, to work with NUMSA and put a, a legal case uh, to the Houghton North High Court. And we said the obligations for the state to supply its citizens with electricity is legislated. The state is obliged and the state is a supplier of the last resort. When all else fails, we are bound to look to the state to give us electricity. And you 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 can go with it, you can you can look you read this slide at your own time. But when all else fails, the state must provide South Africans with electricity and must provide critical load centers with, with, with electricity. And the court agreed with us. And the court ruled that hospitals, medical facilities, schools must be provided with uninterrupted electricity when there's load shedding. I think that's revolutionary. I am from the village and I can't take it when I see my school without electricity. So now we are beyond that. So it's, I thought I must put that in, that when all else fails, the bug ends with the Department of Public Enterprises. Uh, I don't want to talk about Minister of Electricity, Minister of Energy, uh, there's no need for that. I, I, I don't think we should have got to that stage. We, I was fortunate to be part of the team at ESCOM before the new dispensation in 2008 to do the, what you call the integrated electricity supply plan. And we defined a concept called the reserve margin. And in our mind as engineers, informed by the government of the day was that the reserve margin is the exposure that the country must have to the electricity that is imported. So at West, our risk exposure to the supply of electricity is to the reserve margin. Then it was 15%, now it's 19%. What it means is that the maximum electricity South Africa can have from imported resources is 19%. That has an implications of how much of gas you can import, that has implications of how much hydro you can import. I mention this because it set out your boundary conditions. It is not free for all. You can do whatever you want. You've already committed in Kaora Basa, 1,500 megawatt. You can import gas. You can import hydro from DRC. For interest of national security, your reserve margin is the maximum you can import. And the maximum that the, the, the reserve margin can be is defined in the integrated energy plan. And that's 19%. Keep that in mind, uh, because you're going to encounter that. I argue that the challenges in the electricity sector are not new and have not changed since 2010, except that the reserve margin has increased to 38%. Now, if you can keep the lights on with the reserve margin of 38%, you should not be here. You should not be in the job. It's as simple as that. You've got 47,000 47, megawatt of nominal generation capacity. Your maximum demand in this year is 34,000 megawatt. Your reserve margin is 38%. What more do you want? You've no capacity problem. You've got more than enough. We've got 38% reserves in your, in your power system. It's got whether Tabombegi decided to build power station later or not is irrelevant. You've got 38 38% reserve margin today that should meet the maximum demand of 34,000 megawatt and allow you to deal with whatever disturbance that is there. And if you can't keep the lights on without burning diesel, 
and doing the necessary maintenance that you require, then you're incapable. You should not be there. And we should not tolerate you. It's as simple as that. You know, I've listed the challenges since 2010. You will see them. If you listen to somebody today about the electricity challenges today, he'll regurgitate what was there in 2010. He'll regurgitate what was there in, 2000, in 2007. What he will not tell you is that we've got a better reserve margin today than we did in 2007. We're in a better position today than we were in 2007 and eight. We're in a better position today than any other time. In fact, when we had the lowest, the, the, the in, when we started increasing our electricity electrification, we had a reserve margin of 37%, 2001, 2002, 2003, 37%. We are back there today. So we should be seeing the cost of electricity coming down because we've got surplus, not going up. And we should be asking questions, but why is the cost of electricity going up when we've got surplus generation capacity and why are we in the dark? I argue it's a leadership issue. It's not a technology issue. It's not a generation capacity issue. With the right leadership, it can be done and it's been done in the past. Now, if I fail to do anything, if I fail to convey anything, yes. this graph is the most important graph in my presentation. It gives you ESCOM history since 2001. And all what the newspapers want to do, and the lobbyist, they're saying this decline that you see here must be blamed on President Tabombegi. And after all, he apologized for it. But we are engineers, and this is a 12 months moving average. And there's a lot you can, you can read in these graphs. And if you cannot, you know, if you look at this graph, you can see something happened there. If you can't explain what happened there, then you don't know what you're doing. You can see another thing happened there. Energy availability factor is what you need to keep the lights on. And you can see that it's been declining since 2001. 2001 is a time when ESCOM is famously, uh, uh, ESCOM was at its best in 2001 because it was a global company of the year, global utility of the year. Every time they say that, I say, they forget to tell you that in that year, the engineer of the year was Machala at ESCOM. And it is no coincidence that my cohort of 2001 rose to lead ESCOM. It was premeditated. It was designed that way. And what needs to be done is to repeat exactly what put Machela Koko as engineer of the year in 2001 to what is happening today. By the way, it doesn't matter whether you like him or not. And if you think he was captured, we will deal with it later. And if you think he's going to go to jail, we'll deal with that later too. I did say that there are no holy cows and I've got a thick skin, you can deal with that. You can also see that something else happened there. Now, the, the, the energy availability factor came down all along. And something that must preoccupy scholars is that what happened there? Why did the energy availability factor turn? Why did ESCOM performance turn? You know, look at the gradient. And that's when we stopped load shedding. 8th of, 8th of August, 2015. Load shedding stopped. And I'll deal with why we had load shedding. I prepared for that. And then we had this. And the rest is history. Twenty first of February 2018, Cabinet took a decision. 
that Machula Koko must be dismissed to avoid a crisis at ESCOM. At the peak of his performance, and um, I leave it to you to see if the crisis was abetted. The writing is on the wall. Before then, we had a reliability objective of 97, 90% availability, 10% plan, 7% plan maintenance, 3% breakdowns. What happened in the first, the, it was just after the World Cup, we were running out of reserve margin. That was the consequences of Tabombek. We had to repair it. It ends there. No one should be talking about the effect of Tabombegi government. He must stop at 2010. That's it. We fixed it then. Post President Mbegi era, we acknowledged we made a mistake. We acknowledged government did not do the right things. We changed our reliability objectives. We said we will now have 80% availability, 10% unavailability, uh, plan maintenance. 10% breakdowns throughout since 2012. As a matter of fact, and go and check ESCOM records, we exceeded our maintenance plan. We did more maintenance than we planned. Anybody who tells you maintenance was neglected, tell him, go, go to the ESCOM books, go to the ESCOM records, look at the data. The data will tell you the target was 10%. We did 10.5%. We did more maintenance than we planned. And on top of that, we had a peak in performance. It worked. So maintenance is not an excuse. The age of plant does not matter. Engineers will tell you the age of plant does not matter. Anybody who tells you you exceed maintenance, he does not know what he's talking about technically. Anybody who tells you the age of plant matters, he does not know what he's talking about technically. I go into detail to show why we should stop using excuses. The load shedding of 2007 was because of the policy mistakes that arise out of 1998 white paper. It caught up with us in January of 2008. We started load shedding. But there was no load shedding between 2009 and 2014. We had a decent reserve margin of 16%. The target is 15%. Load shedding came back on the 2nd of November 2014. It was on a Sunday. I was there. On that day, I flew to Majuba Power Station because a 10,000 coal silo collapsed. And that forced us into the load shedding of 2000, we lost 3000 megawatts. It was one in a hundred year event. The root cause was contraction defect that happened 20 years before our time. It's a unique experience. You can't generalize on it. We knew what was wrong and we knew what to, what to do to fix it. And it took us almost, it took us up to, uh, from the 2 November, 2014, to 8 August 2015, we fixed it, load shedding stopped again, because it was specific. We knew what caused it. We addressed it, and we moved on. I really hope this works, because that's what I wanted to write. I think it will. Footage has emerged online of ESCOM's coal silo collapsing at the Majuba power plant. The collapse resulted in the country being plunged into darkness on Sunday as ESCOM struggled to keep up with electricity demand.
Now, according to reports, the collapse of the silo resulted in a dramatic drop in energy output from 4,000 megawatts to just 600. The silo carried over 10,000 tons of coal. Trade Union Solidarity accused ESCOM of being aware of structural problems at the silo, but ESCOM CEO Tsedi Somatona said that when the silo was last inspected, it was found to be in good working condition. While no load shedding was experienced today, ESCOM confirmed the system would be under severe pressure tomorrow and on Thursday. For all the latest load shedding video news, stay tuned to News24 Live. Now, that's a silo that collapsed, 10,000 ton silo that carried coal, 2nd November 2014. That's how it ended after the collapse. There is it. So, this has nothing to do with Sabombegi. This is what cost those shedding in 2014 to 2015. We knew what was wrong. We went out, we fixed it, no shedding stopped. There should be no shooting after this. But the worst load, and, 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 and this is how we stop load shedding. People keep on asking, but how did you get it? You know, we built a very high performance organization in ESCOM, and we assumed, we took our power station units. We said every single ESCOM power station unit is like a Formula One car and must perform like a Formula One car and must be treated as such. And every time it must get to the podium. And when it, it gets out of the pit stop, it must get to the checkered flag. So imagine Toto in Mercedes. Imagine Louis Hamilton. Imagine that car. It must look like you must, it's exactly like an ESCOM unit. It should not have surprises. Once you drive it and it gets out of the pit stop, it must get to the checkered flag. But the intention must not to get to the checkered flag. It must get on the podium because nobody remember, if you're not on the podium, nobody remembers you. That's how we stop load shedding. There are too many things, but we are engineers. Our pride as engineers is a design base for the units or the car we drive. Out of the design base, you get your operating base, you get your maintenance base, you get your safety case. This you protect jealously. Imagine Toyota in Germany. Imagine the engineer who designed Lexus in Germany. He is passionate about the design of this car. He's passionate about that manual that you see in the cable. When you take it, you always have this thick manual in your car. It's your, it's your maintenance base, your design base. You drive your car within the operating technical specification, nothing else. And if you do that, it will get to the podium. And if you do that very well, you'll be in the middle. Hamilton or the other guy that I don't like. This is how the championship was won between 2014 and 2017. You can see the diesel costs. We bent no diesel 2016, 2017. We built no diesel. And if you've got a presence of mind, this is the years that are defined by Justice Zondo as the years of state capture. State capture collapses institutions. State capture is corruption. Corruption is like cancer. It eats you from the inside. It does not drive performance. When you have what you think is, you are told is state capture, you should be saying in the years of state capture, it must be like cancer. ESCOM must have been eaten from the inside. It must show worse performance. Now I put it to you, in the years that are defined to be the worst, the years of Cape Chapter, you've got the best performance since 20, 2001. The number speaks for themselves. 
and we did the most maintenance. And we did not load shed. And then under the later camps. And the less I talk about that, the better. But that's how championships are won. What must be done? So I, I like that slide. What is to be done? When we are students, we, uh, that question used to fascinate us. We must be customer centric. The customer in this case is a systems operator. If you don't do what the systems operator tells you, you're not going to win. The systems operator saying to us, and I put a reference there, I need 3,800 megawatts of reserve to keep the systems stable and to support renewables. And by the way, the only way to do that is to commit to a big pump storage scheme. And the reason I'm saying load shedding is about leadership. It's not about technology because we know it. The systems operator is telling us, just do it. Just simple as that. M manage your pistols, focus on your work, how condition of your plant, works management, works identification. Build a capable organization, build a capable workforce. You know, we took 50 students with VTEC to Germany in 2016 to train them as op advanced operators. We put 20 students to Germany to train them as design operators. We, we had 30 students that were trained as consultants. We established as ESCOM Engineering Power Plant Institution uh, to, to, to produce masters and PhDs engineering. We were building a capable organization. We, you, know, you can read about how you improve organization uh, and operations, but it's all about the smell of the place. And I was telling Dr. Nyoka that when I come to roads, I don't need to be told about roads. I must smell the place. I must smell the place. I must know that we have a high performance culture here. I must see it. I don't need to be told. When you walk into an engineering organization, you don't need to be told. You must smell it. It's a smell of the place. It takes five to 10 years to build a capable high performance culture. It takes one day to collapse it. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Koko. Okay, guys, Masicha is at Kuma. We'll take four questions for Mr. Koko. Four questions and comments, uh, if you have comments, but keep your questions short, all right? Okay, we'll start from you, then the four of you in that order. All right. Um, we'll take those four questions for now. For October 27, 2022, quite an interesting event. I'm again appearing in court on the third of on the second of September. Now let me tell you, I will have I will have the last laugh. They have set themselves up for failure. I will have the last laugh. It is good that I'm in court because the court is the arbitrator when in doubt. We must celebrate it. I celebrate it. They have set themselves up for failure and I will have the last laugh. Am I, was I part of the problem? There's a scorecard. Speaks for itself. Numbers don't lie. Numbers do not lie. 
I burnt 1 million tons of diesel a month. Today, ESCOM is spending 50 million diesel a month. I spent 3.2 million rents in a month. Today, ESCOM is spending 3 billion rents in a month. I had three uninterrupted years of load shedding. I did the most maintenance. Numbers do not lie. Are there people benefiting from diesel? I don't wanna go there. It's not my space. I don't have the evidence. I, I, I'm not a conspirator. Is, is privatization going to solve our problems? I don't think so. The obligation to run ESCOM is the states. Whether you privatize ESCOM or not, the legislation is clear. The state must provide electricity to its own people. And I don't think the states can defer that to the third parties. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, we still have time for second round. There was a hand somewhere, yeah. Eh? Oh, yeah. Okay, who else? You? Which one? All right, sure. So we'll start there. Um, so Mr. Coco, allow me to ask is um being part of the larger group that's being affected by the low trading, um, did you and your family directly or indirectly benefit from the tenders associated with ESCOM? Who else? Thanks. Okay. Uh, I just want to confirm with you, uh, Mr. Gogo uh, Matsela, if uh, Mat uh, Matsela uh, Energy Company, the objective of Matsela Energy Company is to eradicate monopoly companies such as ESCOM, since we know that monopolies such as ESCOM, they can, uh, they lead to market failures they lead to uh, they enable political uh, influence, political influence and uh, corruption. I just want you to confirm with me if the objective of the company is to eradicate monopolies such as ESCOM. Since I just heard you highlighting that we buy uh, we buy electricity at a very high cost, but we're still in the dark. Is that is that not a uh, abuse of power by this uh, regulated monopoly of ESCOM or what? I, I hold the view that anyone who benefited directly and indirectly improperly so must go to jail. No, I did not benefit directly or indirectly. And anybody who has must go to jail and we should not have tolerance of it. The law must bite. The law must bite. Corruption is a cancer. We should never tolerate it. The debate should not be between renewables and nuclear. All technologies on the table, they have their own place. You cannot stop your neighbor from putting a solar panel on his rooftop, given the current prices is economical. But wind plus solar plus storage is not the grid and can never be the grid. The state is obliged to build a grid that is stable and that is reliable. And the grid that is stable and that is reliable cannot come out of wind, solar, and batteries. It can only come out of electricity that is required 
on demand, that is available on demand. Nuclear is classified green. If you ask me, and I did not make it my topic, I do not think we can decarbonize the electricity sector at the scale we want to decarbonize without nuclear. I hold the view that if we're doing all things right, we should be committing to a pump storage scheme today, and we should co be committing to, into a 2,400 megawatt of nuclear, and they must be operational by 2035. That will provide us the backbone of the grid. We can then close the old stations, and nuclear can replace them. And the pump storage schemes can give the systems operator the battery storage, that, the storage that they require. But the debate is not nuclear versus renewables. All technologies on the table, deploy them uh, 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 when they fit. Does it answer you? I think there's a very strong role for the private sector and we must enable it. But it will be a very sad day if ESCOM disappears. It will be a very sad day. Everywhere else in the world where a vertically integrated utility disappears, the prices go up. Go check it. So, ESCOM must remain. In fact, the energy white paper was, was right when it said uh, ESCOM must do 70% of the new build program and the private sector must do 30% of the new of, of the new build program. I think that was a right mix. And to be honest with you, it does not matter how we what, what we want, the right thing will happen. Trust me the right thing will happen. You must listen now. People are beginning to realize that uh, um, they've made mistakes. The right thing will happen. I think we should wrap it up. All right, guys. Um, Firstly, thank you, Mr. Coco, for coming uh, to Rhodes and uh, for your presentation. And thanks to all of you guys for, for attending. So tomorrow um, we have Sikonati Manjanja, who, was, who is the outgoing spokesperson of ESCOM, um, who is going to address us tomorrow on the energy crisis. So please attend. <laughs>